Welcome back to Hey on Trek Frankfurt, the Bundesliga podcast covering everything there is to know in the English language about Eintracht Frankfurt and the Eintracht Frankfurt Frauen. I am Chris here in the middle of Michigan, the Great Lakes State, where it is still pleasantly 70 degrees. Uh, uh, just a fantastic Labor Day weekend. Uh, we're going to recap everything that happened here around Eintracht Frankfurt and both Bundesligas. Um, of course, I don't do the show alone. Never have, never will. It is difficult. Uh, ways you can get in touch with the show, www.hefpod.com, H-E-F-P-O-D.com. Links to all of our social medias are on that page uh, and a direct contact link. If you want to get in touch with the show, if you want to contribute to the show, give us your opinions um, and any ideas for upcoming content. We're always looking for new content. We're always looking for contributors. So hit us up there at halfpod.com uh, where you can see links to get in contact with us. And um, yeah, like I said, not doing this show alone. Certainly not this week. There's way too much to discuss, both the men's and women's side of the complex. Let's go east to west today. Uh, east coast, second best coast besides that here in Michigan, <laughs> to the salted waters of Delaware. John Ben, welcome back. How you doing, buddy? Happy holiday. Doing great, you know, enjoying the, the day off right now, so can't be uh, any worse, that's for sure. Or it couldn't be hardly better, I should say. It's fun to record on a Monday, because, uh, especially a holiday Monday, because that means Tuesdays are going to come, and basically it's Wednesday, and once you make it to Wednesday, well, the week's over, right? So we're pretty <laughs> much in the next weekend, in the next Bundesliga action, right? <laughs> well, except we got this weekend off with the oh, international wait. break. On the men's side, that is yeah. correct. Uh, but, but we got we got some a lot exciting... to talk about for the front. Oh yes, and back in my neck of the woods, a uh, man who know, needs no introduction, who's been busy on all soccer fronts this week, Garrett, sitting in Metro Detroit. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. John, great to be with you here again. Uh, Monday night. We hit September, which is a kind of a mind fuck in its own thing with how fast this year's going. Um, but you know, it's still it's still technically summer, but falls in the air and it's magnificent. Okay, I talked a little bit on a previous episode how I'm all in on pumpkin spice everything. I had a frozen pumpkin spice latte this morning, and <laughs> it was about fifty degrees outside. Uh, it just felt like fall. I know it's like down in Austin where our buddies down there are listening. It's like a million degrees. It's probably a million <laughs> degrees when Nathan's cutting us up in St. Louis, but 50 degrees and walking my dog in a hoodie this morning was like the ultimate feeling of fall. And it smells like soccer. It smells like football. All the things that we love about fall are like all coming together. I just get so fired up this time of year. Am I alone in that? Do you do you want to go back to hot summer or are we good on fall? No. Considering, that it, was, considering it was 90 here on Friday, uh, no, I don't want that shit at all. I'm <laughs> We're not going back. We are not going back. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going back, that. damn it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. We, we got a long show here. There's a lot to talk about. Um, I'm just going to warn everybody. There's a lot to talk about in this episode. So prepare yourselves buckle in it is going to be a wild ride and there's no better place to start than on track frankfurt three hoffenheim one um about 20 fans traveled over on the a3 a3 i think that's right over to uh frankfurt and literally 20 away fans in that block absolutely despicable one of the worst fan bases in the bundesliga and i'm not biased that is just a matter of fact all right Eintracht Frankfurt 3, Hoffenheim 1. Where do we start? <sighs> Let's start with the lineup. <laughs> John, I think you and I saw this. We shared it about the same time, and we were like, are, are we running a back five? <laughs> because on the list you saw Christensen, Tuta, Koch, Tiazza, and Nkuku, and you're like, that, we're not running a back five, right? But when it rolled out, it was kind of like a back three and a half with guys floating in between lines there and and out to the wing position i mean besides the fact that three one result the way that that back line was organized we might have found something that works don't you think yeah it was uh definitely pretty interesting seeing that i'm i'm not surprised i feel like every coach we've had ends up going back to back three after trying a back four for however short of a time period that is 
But yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting because in when we were in attack, obviously it was a back three pretty clearly with Nkunku and Christensen pushing high forward. And then when Hoffenheim would ever get the ball back, you would see Nkunku and Christensen sprint right back and, and make it a back a line of back five So in defense. And they played very well doing that. Garrett, we asked a lot of questions about Nkunku. Is he ready? How is he going to work with the addition of Tiata coming in? But um, and Nkunku might have had his best game under the on-track crest. Uh, I was absolutely impressed with everything he did. Uh, pleasantly surprised or what you expected from the kid? You know, I think part of it has to do with that shape because, you know, it, it's a very, depending on what the situation is, like you guys were saying, it's immovable. But I feel like with that back three, Teate, you have a great left link of attack with Teate, and Cuckoo and Marmush. On Tuta's right-hand side, you have Tuta, you have Christensen, and then you can feed it into Goza, and Koch can then f- focus on the central midfielders and Shkiri and Larson. And I thought in Cuckoo and Marmush in particular, and um, which was p- big for the first goal, Teate ball, little loop over to Marmush, Marmush kicks it back to Nkuku to get some space open, and Cuckoo sees it, plays it back to Marmush, and, you know, we're off to the running. And I think this, what we saw on Saturday was what we've been, I feel like, waiting to see from D, from a Dino Topmuller coach side since, other than the Bayern game last year, I don't know how many times we did, saw this last year, but it was such a great feeling. Like, and I think, you know, when you see that result, you notice some players standing out more in performances. I think Nkuku is definitely one of those guys. Yeah, and John, I teased it a little bit in previous episodes that if we could ever get Marmouche and Ekatike on the same page, that there might be special something special up front there. Um, but the play moving through and Cuckoo up the side uh, to Marmouche and Ekatike, Ekatike pass off to Larson on that second Oof. goal. I mean, it's just, uh, filthy. Um, dangles left and right. I mean, these guys are doing things that we knew they had the talent to do, but they couldn't really put it together. The guys are are making space and, and creating space in, in tight areas and making nice passes. I mean, it, this is an ultimate team effort kind of game. And e- even one thing that I like to see, too, um, after being up 2-0, once it gets cut to 2-1, the quick response, a goal four or five minutes later uh, to really kind of ice it at 3-1, to one, Let's talk about that Goza cleanup effort. Um, just kind of a an offensive attack stalls, uh, really poor clearance from the Hoffenheim defender. And Goza in full stride just puts the ball right on Marmouche's foot. He's sitting over in that Kostic spot and just kind of puts it in the in the corner. I mean, we've given Goza a lot of shit, and some of it is probably <laughs> fairly earned. Um but the guy just makes plays like he really is technically sound and, you know, he's not who he who he was at one time. And he's never been what was expected out of him with the absurd amount of uh, of expectations around him based on what he did in the World Cup when he was young. But the guy creates and to have the vision of a guy like 30 yards to his left and just put the ball right on his foot that iced the game right there. And it shows me that we've got young talent, we've got experienced guys, and this is meshing together well. Um, John, I don't think Hoffenheim is a side to overlook. They're going to be competitive this season in the Bundesliga. And at no point in that match did I think, oh shit, we're in trouble. Yeah, I would agree completely. I mean, as we saw last year, they only finished one point behind us, and they didn't really have any departures over the summer that I can think of off the top of my head. And Nathan here with a correction. Maximilian Bayer went from Hoffenheim to Borussia Dortmund this offseason. For Hoffenheim last year, he had 16 goals and three assists in 33 matches. Big loss. Back to the show. You know what? We completely dominated that game. It really honestly could have been worse in our favor if, uh, 
maybe some passes had gone a little bit better, but yeah, they, we just, I mean, we had the ball for a lot of the game. Our passing was crisp. Um, even though when we were, when they were in possession, we weren't really pressing them super hard. We were kind of letting them attack, but we didn't allow anything dangerous to happen. The whole back line made so many good clearances um, and, and just gave them no opportunities except for their one goal, really. Um, and then Adam Hojic had another shot, but right at trap. So, yeah, no, it was it was really good. Um, Gutza was a player I was saying before the game needed to have a good game because I thought that he would be crucial to uh, unlocking their uh, midfield, although we kind of just went around them with uh, Nkunku on the left, which is good to see. And, um, yeah, no, his pass to Marmouche on the 3-1 to one goal was, was very nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's frustrating, Garrett. Uh, we're just dying to get a clean sheet once in a while. Um, <laughs> but even that Hoffenheim goal, I mean, I, I thought our guys were well positioned. Our, our defense got caught a little bit with tunnel vision, everyone looking towards the corner and not really aware of who was around them. Um, but the cross was excellent. You can't leave Kramerich inside the six, you know, one on zero with, with Kevin Trapp out of the way too. I mean, that it was a nice goal on Hoffenheim's part, but our resiliency and ability to respond, I really think that says a lot about this group at a point where they could have just wrote it out and hoped, you know, kind of parked the bus a little bit for the last 30 minutes. They went straight back to the attack. Um, yeah. and you know, it, Garrett, it says something to me that our passing is over 85% again, an area where we used to really celebrate that 75% number just last season. <laughs> now we're looking at 85 is like the low point. Are we getting to a point of technical superiority here with um, Marmouche, Akitike, Goza, guys that are really confident on the ball? Are we moving to that next level in talent with this group? I think so, and familiarity. Like, you know, the first matchup against Dortmund, yeah, we we were l missing a lot in attack, but we were resolute enough that Dortmund had to make significant adjustments in the second half to beat us. Set match day two, we step the tempo up. We take we take advantage of the home crowd, and we play with technical ability and with speed and a great combination is it's a sight to see and it's something that if they can keep this going more often than not this year this team will go places over the three competitions that they're in and you were talking about like the cram and you were talking about the Cramrich goal I mean that was it's an inch perfect pass and when you have a guy who's coming off of a hat trick in match day one and he's there to just tap it in I mean he's going to definitely get that opportunity but again like the intent to drive forward and then go so it's just basically what I call like a hockey pass, right? You got the two men in stride and you and you play it absolute like as hard as possible. Uh, but Marmush had like enough time. I mean Marmush could have tied his shoes. Marmush could have like, you know, <laughs> tested everything out. He could have maybe walked in it. It cause it was the level of IQ on Goats and the play that ball completely mm. threw everybody off. I think even Omar Marmouche, because he's like, oh, fuck. Um, and, you know, I think that's rewarding. If that mean, if if our current squad is allowing him to get get that type of, like, seeing the game out of Mario Goza, oh, we may be getting the best version of him in his third season with us. And hopefully you know that's I, the case. I, what I think we're getting from Kota right now is the one who's not having to be relied on to generate offense or create offense. He just has to facilitate some opportunities. He doesn't right. have to be doing the work. And I think maybe I was a little strong on him expecting that last year. Um, but this year, you know, he, he doesn't have to be the guy doing the work. There's plenty of them around there. He just found an opportunity and took care of it. And that's, you know, that's really all he's being asked to do right now. And I think he's filling that role reasonably well. Garrett, you got a, uh, this is where we earn our parental advisory tag. You got a <laughs> fucked up stat of the week for us. Drop that effed up stat. Fucked up stat time, y'all. Um, so, 
I tried Frankfurt scored three in their home opener. And I was like, and originally I was like, I could find this on FopMob. When's the last time did we score three goals in our home opener in a season play? And I kept going back, and I couldn't find anything. And I'm going back, and I'm like, shit. So shout out to Eintracht. Uh, the website is Eintracht-Archive, A-R-C-H-I-V dot day A. Um, always clutch, especially when you're looking for historic Eintracht kit history. Uh, make sure you hit that translate German to English if your Deutsch isn't that strong. Um, but Eintracht Frankfurt's men scored three goals in their home opener for the first time since two, August of 2002 when they beat St. Saint P- Saint Pauli 3-0 in spite to league of play. This was the first time it gets better. The last time I tracked Frankfurt scored three goals in their home opener in top flight Bundesliga play, August of 2000, against Spiel Veranagon Unterhaking. That's, you know what? That's impressive research. Like, <laughs> for, all, for all the stuff Brian puts out there, I don't even think he would have found that anywhere. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> I was, John, yeah, this is yeah. wormhole. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's well done, well researched by you. John, um, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Uh, That bumps us up from like 17th in the table to 9th. Obviously, it's week two of 34. We're not quick here to to look at the table, but really a a good bounce back performance, I think, from how low we felt after some blown opportunities against Dortmund. Uh, And then with a week week off here to kind of settle ourselves this is kind of a good time i think for a rest because we got our feet wet and then we can sit back kind of you know evaluate where we are look at the good things look at some of the things we need to improve on as much as it's tough to go into a break after a victory i think this one is well timed do you agree yeah i think so you know we'll still be riding high on confidence um you know we just learned our european schedule we learned our Pokal match, there's there's a lot to think about for the team right now, and I, I think that having this weekend off is, is not a bad thing for them. Exactly. Garrett, any closing thoughts on this one? Um, I agree, especially on the international break. We did get in a deadline edition on the final day. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dehoud, I believe, um, who came over from Brighton & Hove Albion. Um, formerly of Borussia Dortmund, so he's very familiar to Bundesliga play. So I think, um, you know, I'm not sure how many we have out to international play. Robin Koch, I think, is probably out. Um, I'm guessing Omar Marmush, uh, but... Knauf is playing for the U21s oh, as well. We got, thir- um, I just see this here, we got 13 national players by the looks of it, because I found this on the... Website. So we got um, Nathaniel Brown, Einskar Knopf on Germany's U21. Uh, Robin Koch um, is with the senior squad for Germany, Namandi Collins to the U20 juniors. Um, you are also having Hugo Larsson to Sweden, Kam Uzon, Kam Uzon to Turkey, Igor Matanovic to Croatia, uh, Arthur Teat to Belgium, Rasmus Christensen to Denmark, Marmos to Egypt. Um, and then uh, uh, Orle Amenda to Swiss, uh, Christian Litsis to Hungary's U21, and John Matteo Bahoya to uh, France's U20s. You mentioned Bahoya. Um, I, I kind of want to see some. Like, we, we keep seeing him in the group, but we don't see him feature at any point here. I've kind of been anxious since he came in late last year to – see what's there i mean it's kind of like that with a couple other guys where we keep giving that spot in the 18 to them but yet they don't feature at any point i don't know where do we stand with bohoya john are we just being patient because he's a a young guy or or yeah i'm kind of frustrated by it i'm not really sure what the plan was when we brought him in because you know we had just lent out pax and aronson and we bring in Boy. I know they're not exactly like for like players, but still, you know, very young attacking players that didn't really have an opportunity to crack the starting lineup. And I don't think that he has that either. I mean, 
He was a very good player for uh, Angers in the second division in France. Uh, he's definitely got some talent, um, and y- you would hope that we wouldn't just be sending him to the second team to play in the in the Regina Liga because that I think won't provide him with the competition level that he needs. But if it's a way to get him some game time right now, I think it might be a good thing to do. Um, Cause clearly I don't think he's going to be seeing game time with the first team, despite being in the, in the starting or not in the starting lineup on the bench for the games. But we also might see him drop out now that Moda is in and possibly if uh, Mbembe gets reintegrated sooner rather than later. Yeah, Garrett, we've gotten to a point now where, you know, the the transfer window is closed. We know who our group is, and I think Dino's starting to find the rotation that he's comfortable with. Um, And we're in a unique position more than any time in my recent memory where we have plenty of talent and depth, not entirely across the board, but, you know, pretty much in, in the front end, certainly, and then through the midfield, just an excess of depth. Um, You know, we don't want to mess with a good thing while it's going good right now, but I think it's good that guys like Bahoya are still getting the call-ups and others that are not regulars on the pitch with the first team get that opportunity to play meaningful minutes. If it's for their country, that's still better than sitting on the bench for us, right? Yeah, and I think, too, um, I look at it now, unfortunately for us, when we talk about the Pokal, like if we had like lighter opposition for round two, then yeah, get Bahia in for that. But you know when we yeah. go over these Europa League eight that we have, there might be some opportunity for him to get some minutes in on those. But I yeah. feel like you know because obviously you have to decide at that point because you got like when you look at like okay you got Shaibi, Canal, Bahia, Matanovic, and that's just attacking on the subs bench trying to get in. So that kind of gives you, a, and then Mbembe and all that. So, I mean, that's, it's, you have to be, you have to really be impressing in training and you, you need a, a setback for somebody else for, to get a spot in by the looks of it now. Um, and then we just got the Howd and then Oscar Hoyland too, who's, you know, going to be coming back from injury. So I think it's, it's, an unusual feeling to an extent to have this many numbers ready to roll for us. Uh, but now we just got to be like, all right, where are we putting all these people in? We said it before uh, collectively as a group. And I'm going to say it again right here. What Marcus Crocher has done to, to sell players for a ton of money and get incredible value on some young guys uh, you know, there's a couple flyers out there that we don't know about yet, but I think on the whole, anyone from any viewpoint can look at it and say, so far he's done outstanding work. And, uh, you know, it remains to be seen how things are going to pan out the remainder of the season. And January could bite us in the ass, depending on how things go. But right now, I am really confident going into battle with this group. Uh, do either of you have... Any deep-seated concerns about the makeup of this group going into the the Hinrunde? I don't know if uh, it's any real concern, but I do think that uh, the the moves over the summer really pointed towards having the depth for a back four, just because Christensen's more of a back four right-sided defender. I know he's playing very forward for us, but that's not necessarily his strengths. And Nathaniel Brown, he, I think he even said in an interview that he doesn't really feel comfortable playing in a left wing back role. He likes playing in the left back role in a back four. Um, so it just seems interesting to shift away from that um, very quickly into the season. That said, I think with our group, that's that's fine. And we still have a really good squad with a lot of depth. Um, bringing in Dehoud in the midfield, I think, was absolutely massive. And to be able to get him on a free from Brighton, I... I don't really know what happened there because he still had a contract with them for a couple more years. Maybe they terminated yep. or something, but that's that's an amazing piece of business because he, I think, is going to be really good for us. Um, you know, his passing, I think, will be really, really helpful. Garrett, final yeah. thoughts? Uh, Dehood, yeah, 28 years old, so I think it's, a, like I said, an absolutely great move. Um, 
my one concern is if there's injuries centrally. I know Ellis Gary's wearing the uh, face mask because of the collar, uh, the cheekbones. So, um, you know, maybe, I mean, but this is where, I think this may be where Mbembe gets in his minutes this year, or maybe as like right back cover, especially with Aurelio Buta now uh, out to Stade Rhymes on loan for the rest of the year. So um, I think when we brought in the th- to John's point about Nathaniel Brown, I think when we brought Nathaniel Brown in, I think we didn't have the thought maybe that we'd be selling William Pacho to PSG for that much money. So I think the Pacho sale then constituted the need to bring Teate in, which then means like, hey, here's another piece of versatility in the back line. Yeah. So that might be, depending on these matchups now, where we might see that this tactical variance in there, but it's still, we're, we got to get to those points in the season and see how these teams are playing to get there. But I would say if there's a sweet spot anywhere where I'm concerned right now, it may be central of the midfield, but I think the hood helps fill that and they'll find a way to get people in to make an impact one way or another. Yeah. yeah certainly and- we have, we have a luxury of depth there right now in a few positions that allows us to be flexible. John, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, and, you know, Dino had been experimenting with Tuta as a six. So, you know, if, if right. Skiri were to be out longer term or if Larson or Dehu gets injured, um, obviously with Hoyland out, then I think Tuta, I mean, obviously I think if Bembe could play there as well, but I think Todd Muller wouldn't hesitate to put Tuta in there if the need arose. Yeah, that means then Teate go, Te goes back in there to the left central, then you put Nathaniel yep. Brown in, and there's your back four. Yep. Just from the perspective, watching from my nice American air-conditioned home, uh, <laughs> watching Skiri play with that face mask on looked horrific in the you know ninety-degree Fahrenheit heat, and he gets smashed in the face. I'm like, dude, that that just <laughs> looks painful, yeah, like was... broken cheekbone and all. I mean. It, it's got to be uncomfortable enough running out, out there with that thing on and then to get hit in the face, no less. Like, I mean, it, any, anybody that says this is a soft game, John, you and I were watching that match. Um, where, who was it that got their face taken off this weekend? Uh, by Oh, oh uh, Boniface kicked a Hydara and, and just clean knocked him out. Yes, uh, I, I literally circuit. yelped from my couch. That was just horrific. Yeah. Yeah, that was not a good watch. <laughs> I mean, th- this game can be brutal like that, but we're off topic. Um, no, <laughs> I mean, really, I think we're feeling good coming off of a win and going into the break. We're only going to feel more confident coming out of it, especially guys going to get some international experience. Uh, let's talk about what happened around the Bundesliga. Um, not a lot of chaos. Uh, obviously, the big one, RB Leipzig, 3-2, knocking off Leverkusen. Their first Bundesliga loss in a full calendar year. That was an exciting match to watch. It's like, I don't know who I hate more in that situation. Obviously, it's <laughs> a, the tin can, but if Leverkusen has to go down, I think we kind of saw that one coming just because there was no way they were going to keep up that winning streak the remainder you know, or at least to the early part of the year, the way they did the entirety of last year. Were you kind of surprised the way it went down? I mean, it, it, it was kind of chaos with Rosa getting thrown out and, you know, going to sit in the stands. And yeah. That match had a little bit of everything in it, John. Yeah, no, that was that was something. And Leverkusen was playing very well for most of that yeah. first half. And I wasn't surprised, you know, when they went up 2 nothing, but then... At the very end there, Kevin Campbell, of all people, getting wide open and putting one in. And then in the second half, Leipzig started to get some pressure, and they kind of exploited some of uh, of Leverkusen's defense. I, I think that's definitely their weakest part, the weakest part of their team. I know they just brought um, Matuaki, right, f- who former Leipzig player who went to PSG, to be a uh, cover back there, but I think that you know, they, they somewhat exposed their defense. Um, Leverkusen had already looked shaky against Stuttgart in the Super Cup and against uh, Mönchengladbach last week, so I don't think it's super surprising that Leipzig was able to beat them. You know, they're, they're a team that I think are very, very good, 
even though I despise them. <laughs> um, Garrett, I got one for you. Last last year's Bell of the Ball, VFB Stuttgart, um, come out and end up with a three three draw against Mines this week. Is I mean, after what Stuttgart spent in the off season, seventy million plus, is it time to panic now? Starting off the year with two draws through two matches. Um, I mean, again, it's so early. You don't want to get too well, nervous. They, they, they lost what they spent. to Freiburg first game. So only one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, matches. you're right. You're right. One loss, one draw out of the first two. Panic button yet in Stuttgart? No, not yet. I think if anything, it's – if anything, this that's a team that's really going to look forward to the international break. Um, but they do – you can see the weakness. The weakness for Stuttgart right now isn't the attack. Um with all their new uh, wait, I mean, Undav being a permanent, um, the, the Marovic, the attack is there. They're looking well, but um, like Leverkusen, Leverkusen had a two 0 lead and blew it. I mean, but the difference is they were playing a Leipzig side that's got Openda, that's got Xavi, that's got even Kempenkampel with many years of Bundesliga service. Stuttgart did that at home for Mainz, um, which Mainz fights, but why are you giving that much space for Mainz to? claw their way back, not from just a 2-0 deficit, but 2-1, they tie it at 2, and then you have a 3-2 lead at stoppage time. So um, I think it's just like maybe they thought they could get in with work with just effort, not as without putting the work in on that. This is a lesson that you can't do that. Um, so do they use this international break to get sharpened up defensively to get ready ahead of the um, return from the break and then getting into the Champions League schedule, for their sake, they hope they, they better. You know, I yeah. actually uh, watched the replay of this game, and I thought Stuttgart looked, for the most part, very, very good. Um, obviously, on Mainz's tying goal at the end, they left them wide open, and that should never have happened. And yes, you know, their defense, obviously they've got that kid chasing who shows some promise, but very young. Chabot is a new signing for them, but if it weren't for Robin Zentner, I don't think Mainz would have been anywhere near that game. And the the penalty for Mainz's first goal probably should never have been a pen. So, like, I, I think it's a game the Shukart should have won, um, and they'll be fine going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's so early in the year. We're not drawing any conclusions uh, at this point, but what we do know factually after two weeks of Bundesliga play uh, I don't think anyone predicted this. Heidenheim sitting number one in the table right now. Two victories on a... Um... Playing great football, too. Yeah, they yeah. looked really good. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, John, we John and I were going back and forth on it, yeah. Go ahead. I said John and I were kind of going back and forth on it yesterday in, in the Discord because... You know, Augsburg's made a bunch of changes on there. And yeah, I think Augsburg had a couple of moments... But there's just something about a Frank Schmidt coach side that they can make all those changes that they've brought on, and people are buying into that. And I think it's that's a team that if they're keeping up this, this might be like what Union were a few years ago, uh, but with much less, you know, amount of money coming in. And now they're having like Chelsea come in for the and for a Conference League match. So you got motivation on this. If this team can keep it up, they they might even progress even more so than what they did in the Bundesliga, which is kind of wild to say. You know, I, I had that on my list of notes here to, to discuss. We had Union a few years ago, we had Stuttgart last year, Heidenheim this year. It, it seems like each year right now we've got one team making a jump up and I mean, it's certainly way too early to draw conclusions, but they look for real. And I think that's where your modern sports analytics and and looking at things a little bit different way puts you in a position to compete because you might be overlooked. I think I had them finishing 10th in the league. I said, and, it, you know, we still haven't gotten to the point where they're playing in Europe and having to manage the three games in seven or eight days schedule. But certainly right now in league play, they look focused. They look like a threat. And I wouldn't be shocked if they stick up there, at least the way that they've played so far this season. John? Be interesting to see what they do in conference league, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that with – 
they're, you know, having to play a lot more games with the Conference League. That's that's going to be the real test for them. Do they play six games only, or do they play eight in the league phase? I think they play they, eight they, as well. They on, no, they, they only play six, only six in the Conference League. So okay. they don't have as many extra games as they would playing in Europa League, which is, I think, good for them. Um, but I, I think once... Once those European games get started, that's going to be the real test for Heidenheim. But they look they look for real. I mean, they, they look really good. And Paul Vonner is, you know, loney from Bayern for them, but that kid is insanely talented and, and really going off. 18 years old, and he can commit penalties like he's 25, 28 years old. So cool. Yeah. Absolutely true. So we're going to get back to the men's side in a bit. They're headed into a international break here, but we're going to get back to them a little bit later. Right now we got to move over to the Frauen because um, there's a lot going on there. Speaking about teams that are looking good right now, I'm track Frankfurt Frauen. Finally a competitive match. It Literally like a six-week preseason that just would <laughs> not end. Uh, opening <laughs> Bundesliga play with a 2-0 win against Carl Zeitz, Jana. Uh, Jana, I mean, newly promoted. We didn't expect a lot from them. They were on their heels from the start. I, By the way, I, I got to say it again. It, this isn't <laughs> against anybody. It's not personal. Here we go. But we're going we're gonna to pool our money, and Brian is going to buy the rights to the Frauen, Frauen Bundesliga here in the States because this is absolutely absurd that we could not see this match. Just put it out there. People will watch. Please, for the love of God, uh, give us full matches. I am tired of downloading it via WeTransfer from my buddies in Denmark. All right, moving <laughs> on. Um, so I'm track two and Yana zero. Uh, really a side that was on their heels from the start. And the fact that they held it scoreless through the first half. First of all, uh, props to the club for honoring the six uh, Eagle Bears that won the bronze medal for Germany at the Olympics, kind of starting things off on a positive note. Um, and things certainly carried over a similar lineup to what we saw against Hoffenheim in the friendly last week. I really felt after, you know, I saw the stats, I didn't bother to get up and follow stats because following a match live on Twitter is bullshit since <laughs> I couldn't see it here. Um, but after I was able to watch the match tonight, I feel like the 2-0 scoreline is generous. Uh, it really could have been, you know, one of those 4 or 5 nil matches. And it probably would have been later in the year um, uh, to get people up to speed. It was scoreless through the first half, um, but the possession was <laughs> like a, a ridiculous 81% to Eintracht in the first half. Uh, it cooled down to 74% for the full match. Um, but just an outstanding pressure from a side that was completely overmatched uh, for this one. 57th minute, Reutler picks a ball up all alone on the outside of the 18-yard box, curls it really nice on the left yeah, that post. That was a nice shot. I mean, really, like both goals coming from outside. Um, uh, 81st minute, a new signing since uh, well outside the box. Drills one low to the left side. Goalie gets a hand on it, but it was just too powerful and goes in for a 2 0 final. You know what was big for me, though, uh, in this one? I mean, we should have been ahead by more, but in this 62nd minute, Tina Johannes makes a nice save. The only direct save she had to make one on one uh, with, with a shooter from maybe 10 yards out. Just keeping that 1 0 instead of having to go 1 1 into the final third of the match was really a, a confidence boost. And once they put that second one in, it was over from there. But Garrett, how much do you wish you could have seen this game? Uh, um, you know what? The fact that it was also six in the morning here um, <laughs> for kickoff on Saturday, and which I can only imagine the hell for West Coast people being a 3 a.m. kickoff. <laughs> um, thank goodness that at least I was able to go on the club's on track uh, that day. A and watch, the, I think, the Fallon Boone is like a highlight video they had up. Um, but you could tell that that highlight video was one-sided completely, which tells you how dominant the Fallon were in their play. Um, and they just stuck to the game plan. And, like, Loiter's strike was 
she hit it in a way that I think caught a lot of people off guard because she was in stride and it was almost like a poke, but it was a clean hit poke and it was enough to throw the keeper off. And it was just something that I was, when I saw that from Royal, I was like, all right, that's a confidence boosting goal right there. And then they get the second one in. It's like, and not only that too, to not have it be off of your main hitters normally that you come to expect and yell me, crash the car, fry game, dunce to have it from, you know, one from your, a new signing and then two from, you know, an engine in the midfield. That's a good sign. Plus it's a clean sheet. So you start the year off well, and that's good motivation for what we got in the middle of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, we kind of were, a little confused by the lack of signings in the off season, uh, two or yeah, just two signings, uh, but both making their appearance in this one and since specifically uh, getting on the score sheet certainly shows that it's not necessarily how many bodies you move, but the impact they have It's nice to get on the score sheet in week one, right? Oh yeah, definitely. That was, I think maybe a little bit lucky with the goaltender kind of misreading the bounce off the yeah. off the ground, but still, I mean, it was a clean strike, and uh, obviously, I didn't get to watch the game. I only got to watch the highlights. But if, for her to get a goal there, you know, she got a goal in the Olympics as well, and seems to be riding on a on a bit of a confidence boost right now. So hopefully, uh, Lurson can get on the score sheet as well and uh, and start feeling that. Yeah, I think there's a good situation here where I don't think this bench has the depth, maybe, that the men's side does that we just talked about. But on the women's side, the top-end talent in this starting 11, uh, I think we can confidently put up against anyone else in the league and be competitive. Maybe not win against those top two, which we've discussed ad nauseum, but um, certainly there's danger all over the pitch. I mean, in a match that didn't see any Omi start, um, but you got uh, a nice strong attack from Reutler. Frygang was involved since uh, Barbara Dunst was often early and often involved in the play. Uh, the threat is from across the board. It's not left. It's not right. Yeah. It is all over the place. And yeah. as we talk about what's coming up here in the Champions League, later in this episode we'll discuss that. Uh, certainly starting off with a win in league play is exactly where you want to be, right, uh, Garrett? Absolutely. I mean, a good start to the year, a clean sheet at home versus a, in a match you're supposed to win, much better than how we started the year last year. So now keep yeah. that momentum in, keep that momentum in to what we got on Wednesday. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of so. glad we uh, got the league underway as well before the, the tournament this year. Um, I know – you know, that first game against Slovatsko, we did not play it as probably as well as we should have. So it's nice to get, um, you know, a full game under us before playing a very tough opponent. Yep. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit last week or two weeks ago in our Frau and Peer Review about this first week of Frau and Bundesliga play. Bayern did take care of Potsdam pretty easily. RB Leipzig, who we all said was going to surprise people, 2-1 victory over Cologne, uh, Hoffenheim over SGS Essen, and a tie over between Wolfsburg and Bremen. So, you know, certainly week one, no one's panicking early on, but I got to like where we're at. Oh, we got to mention Wolfsburg, too. Um, that game was a hell of a watch. <laughs> Just an incredible game. <laughs> and not, not for good reasons, yeah. to be honest. But um, Wolfsburg's defense looks shaky. And it's something I think I kind of mentioned in the season preview. That's where they're going to be weak. Um, and hopefully teams can take advantage, and especially we can take advantage of that. We have the players to do it. Um, that said, they also had two probably should have been penalties and won the game. But, you know, I'll take it. Still so, hilarious own goal from uh, from Minga today, though. Oof. I saw that. <laughs> so, guys, we're 45 minutes into this. We are just at our segment break. That is how jam-packed this is, and we're only starting. Um, but, you know, 
tradition uh tradition never dies we have to enter the break with hashtag what are we drinking let me tell you guys what i did today uh this being labor day in the united states i went to a local local ice cream place and local dairy farm called mooville and they've been ranked as like usa today's number one ice cream joint in the united states i had some hella good ice cream and the milkshakes there are absolutely incredible uh but garrett i want to know what have you been drinking lately anything good um been really hard on the fago train um the various fago trains um i had a uh dr fago a week or two ago you obviously were here when uh, the last episode when I tried the Orange Dreamsicle, the live t- the live taste test of the Orange Dreamsicle. Um, right now, I have in this Detroit Tigers pint glass here uh, a swig or two left of Moon Mist, which complements very well with the KFC I had for dinner tonight. Um, <laughs> shout out the nut. Um, I didn't realize that KFC used to have nuggets way back in the day. Uh, before my day, but now that they're back, that eight piece nugget and fry meal for five bucks. Mm. Uh, a Not moon mist advertising. Uh, no, no uh, moon mist is a great swig to uh, take that all in after. Garrett, so. I I need you to go down the street to Meyer, get uh-huh. some vanilla ice cream, throw the moon mist on top of vanilla uh-huh. ice cream. It is insane. Um. <laughs> We're actually going to have to try that at the end of the month when I make the trip up. We might have to do, do that. We're going to do that. All right. John, what about you? What are you drinking? Uh, right now I am drinking water, but this past <laughs> weekend I had quite a lot of uh, Pauliner Mertzen. So I think I, for those in the Discord saw the uh, the stack of, of that I had in my little fridge, and uh, it's nearly done now. So had a good time. <laughs> Get in. I love Pauliner. That is Munich's finest. I, I might put Augustine or a little bit above it, but yeah. the fact that that Pauliner will actually distribute to the states makes it absolutely yeah. That that's cool. the thing, you know. Found a couple cases of it in a in a store up the road, so uh, had to grab that. Most of them are not super accessible in <laughs> in Delaware. <laughs> now, for me, uh, I told you I was in Saga Tuck last week. Went to Saga Tuck Brewing Company. Today, I'm drinking down the Maggie's Irish Ale, uh, delicious um, red ale with honey, uh, some West Michigan all-natural honey, really good shit uh, from Saga Tuck Brewing. So yeah, we're going to take a break here at the end of segment one, come back in segment two, and talk about some draws that happen. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, segment two. Hey, on Truck Frankfurt, episode three hundred and twenty-four. We are just knocking them out left and right. All right, guys, this one's a little bit different. We're not going straight into previews. Um, we got some draws we have to talk about, and the first one we're going to talk about is the UEFA Europa League draw. Now, I gotta get, I gotta get my thinking cap on here because this is not your standard <laughs> UEFA Europa League season. We're not talking about group play, three home, three away against the same teams. Uh, The way this is designed this year is there will be eight matches in the first round, and you'll play four home and four away. Uh, So in no particular order, I'm going to knock this out for you, and I'm going to slaughter the names of these clubs. (laughs) So I'm just throwing that out there right right now. I'm putting the website up. (laughs) Uh, So our home matches. Against uh, Slavia Praha. Oh, shit. A team from Hungary. Uh, Ferencvaros. Ferencvaros. Yeah. There you go. Ferenc-Varos. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Pilsen, who I know too well. Uh, RFS out of Latvia. And then on the road, Roma, Lyon, Midtjylland, and Besikis? Midtjylland. Midtjylland. And Besiktas. 
Yeah, that fishing one. tush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, B- just call, just call him BJK. B- BJK works. BJK, there, there we go. Uh, have it your way. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I should add another beer before I, I call those names out. But here's the deal, guys. Four <laughs> home, four away. There's no... I, I think where Eintracht found their success in the previous version of Europa League was feeling teams out either at home or on the road, and then finishing the job in the return match the other way. It was a very successful model, certainly for Oliver Glasner. Um, I'm kind of hesitant here because I don't like adding more matches to the calendar. But seeing this this group of teams, um, I like the way we match up against three or four of them. And the other five, I have no idea who they are. So... (laughs) Uh, John, why don't you go first? How do you feel about this draw for Europa League play? You know, it's it's a very Europa League draw is, is the best I got for it, and that is not a bad thing. You know, the, these are teams in the other top leagues that are pretty much on our level and then champions of other leagues. Um, Besiktas only finished third in theirs, so um, but they have a very solid squad this year. I think they'll be difficult, especially away. Um, it's our away matches that kind of scare me, Leon and Roma especially. Um, but we can't... We have to be careful against some of these others. I mean, Slavia is decent. Ferenc Varos has been in Europe for a number of years now, and we can't take them lightly when they come to our place. Really, the only quote-unquote easy match I think we have is RFS. But other than them, you know, we got to be on our guard. And this is a competition where upsets happen, maybe more than any other European competition. Uh, The Europa League is kind of the wild, wild west of international play. Garrett, uh, what's your initial thoughts on this group of eight? So another thing to note of, we're used to having group stages all take place before the midwinter break. Um, Everything gets done, whereas here this is kind of like the Women's Champions League last year. So you have six of the eight games done before Christmas, um, but then you have two matches. Uh, you have Ferenc Vars at uh, home on the 23rd of January, and then you're at Roma on the 30th of January. Um, so to then, obviously, like depending on how we do, that'll determine if we get to the knockouts. But um, basically, you look at it, you got two matchups, essentially. So first two, back-to-back Thursdays. And then you're off for a few weeks. And then you have two weeks in between games. Um, two weeks in between the next game. So I think it's um, when the matchups you're supposed to and get po- and get points if you can in the other. I think, honestly, even in the away ones, like Michelin, as long, you know, we need to see, you know, if we're banged up anywhere. If we're not banged, I feel good even in the, the only really away games that I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about going to Turkey. Um, and the Mashiktas. Um, it's still it's an Istanbul club. They're gonna be up for it. They love European nights. Uh, Leon, you know they could be. They've had a lot of in and outs, in and outs and bodies. I do know Wilfred Zaha just joined in there too. Um, yeah. Like and they, but they've been moving people in and out. Um, Roma could be Roma, and you know what? Evan Indica gets to play his old club. So does that mean that gets to benefit us because we know how he plays defense? Uh, we shall see. So, um, but I think I'm not going to do anything like we did last year because last year we were humbled mightily in conference league group play. Um, so, but I feel like we play our game, we'll get into the knockouts, but we have, it's on the boys know what they got to do. So John, I I know you got another point to make here, but I also want to bring up one of the things I notice in here is the compact travel. Uh, we're not outside of of Turkey. We're not going too far from home. Um, I see that as a bit of a benefit, but the fact that it's strung out over the span of you know twelve weeks instead of being packed into eight weeks, I think also kind of negates a little bit of that advantage. But what are your thoughts on this group? Yeah, I mean, I I do agree with that. Would have been kind of nice if the uh, Czech teams had been away games for uh, our scheduling purposes in terms of travel as well, but. You know, yeah, obviously Besiktas is kind of far-ish, but it's not the worst thing ever. Going to Denmark, going to Lyon, that's close enough in France, and Roma's not ridiculously far either. So, 
I think that's good. Um, it's not like anywhere in Europe is too, too far, but I think it helps. Um, my other point was just going to be that the way that the table works with the league phase is really, um, I think it's conducive to a lot of the teams from the bigger leagues to at least move on. Only 12 teams get fully knocked out of the competition after the league phase. Um, you know, the top eight get a bye, the next eight play, the next eight after them in, in a knockout round, and of course there's no drop down from the Champions League. So it not b even making top 24 would be quite the failure, in my opinion. I don't mind if we're in that, you know, 9 to 24 range and, and play the knockout. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, just get from, through. From the mathematical need. sense, take care of business at home. Um, yeah. You know, and it, we should be fine. We should be fine at that point. Take care of business at home and steal what you can on the road. Uh, I think part of that comes to playing in good form and, you know, taking advantage of the matchups you have in front of you. If we can do well in league play, because like Garrett drew out that calendar, it's pretty spread out it's not compact mm -hmm. at all so if you know if we can find advantages in play where where we can rest a few guys in advance of these matches because we're doing well in league play and we got a two nil lead and we can rest somebody for 20 minutes instead of running their legs out i would love to be in that position that's why the depth is built into this roster um because we also have another draw that took place <laughs> and <laughs> You know, these matches just never stop. Uh, the calendar continues to get longer, and that is a DFB Pokal draw. Uh, the second round draw, we drew Borussia Mönchengladbach. That's at home on October 30th. I love this draw. I mean, I, I know there were a couple other local ones that we wanted. Uh, <laughs> I think Garrett especially was was calling for uh, Offenbach, or maybe that was Brian. The one that was Offenbach. Brian, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. we go. But um, I love the draw against Gladbach. I think that's one that we've got familiarity with in the Pokal in recent years. 16-17 um, semifinal. This sent us to the final. And that, you know, is really, for me, like, like a great memory. Uh, that match itself was on the edge of my seat the whole way. And, you know, it, here's the thing. You can match up against lower division sides, get a perceived easier draw. But as we know, as anyone that watches the Pokal knows, it, just because you draw a second or third division side, that does not mean the draw is <laughs> any easier. Um, yep. Uh, Man like, Mannheim twice with us. And, of course, yes. Saarbrücken last year, you know. <laughs> yes. And uh, I just... We've been bitten so many times by the lower division side. I'm not about to, you know, jump on that train anymore. I want to play the good teams, and this is a team we're familiar with. We got some bad blood with them. I mean, they mm -hmm. they stole our coach in a very public way in the middle of the season, and I kind of want to pay it back. I, the Pokal means everything in Germany. It means everything to me. That's the competition that I love it, from a practical sense. Eintracht Frankfurt's not going to win the Bundesliga, but we can yeah. win the Pokal. And this is one that I love, and and this is a good draw. And to have it at home, and I think I think I'm going to be in Europe that week. Uh, so this for me is like it's circled on my calendar. I need to make it happen, guys. How do you feel with this one, John? You go I, first, and then I'll take it. I mean, I I don't like the idea of playing Gladbach just because I think they are very solid, but. I don't mind, like you said, I don't mind playing one of the bigger teams. We've gotten <laughs> knocked out by teams that we should have beaten so many times in recent history. You know, it's one of those things we either lose to a team like that or we go all the way, and hopefully this can be the latter. And the fact that it's at home, I think, is also massive. One of the issues with playing those third division or lower sides is you are playing an away game no matter what, whereas we get to play Gladbach in our house, it also is an opportunity to knock out one of the teams that could win the competition, and that's never a bad thing as well. It'll be a tough game, but I think we can handle them. Garrett? 
You got Borussia Mönchengladbach coming to Harrison von Europa either on October 29th or October 30th for round two of the DFB Pokal. As somebody that's been in the Stadion for a DFB Pokal match, it is one of the most electric atmospheres you can take in. Borussia Mönchengladbach, be prepared to count down your time before you get eliminated from DFB Pokal at the end of October. Um, because <laughs> it's um, it's going to be a special night, um, either the 29th or the 30th. So, Chris, get your ticket if you're going to be there. And bring me back, yeah. some, and bring me back something. <laughs> so I'm scheduled to be there that week for work. And, I mean, that week's just going to be all kinds of chaos. We've got an election here in the United States. we got DFB Pokal in Germany. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you another one that I find very interesting in that round. I'm curious from both of you, your rooting interest in this one. Mines against Bayern. Meteor. <laughs> I, I, want, I want neither of them. I know, but <sighs> yeah, that's, that's not an option. One has to go through. Uh, you know what? I, I think Mines is going to be... I said Mainz you know was getting relegated, so if they win, they beat Bayern in the Pokal, that weakens them for the league. Okay, Mainz over Bayern. You know what? I, I might actually change my mind and say Bayern. We beat them in the final. We can do it again. Oh, good point. We've also lost to them, but, yeah, well, you, you know, know it's, it's, I, 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 I feel like Mainz would be the easier road if we run into them down the way. It's a soft game we also know this year compared to years past. I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, so the men's side is off until the 14th uh, international play. They return to play against Wolfsburg on the 14th. Um, but we got to talk about the Prowen here again. And our, our only preview for this week is one, and I'm going to call it one and a half matches. Uh, <clears throat> the potential to continue on Europa, I'm sorry, UEFA uh, Champions League qualifying round trying to get into the group phase uh the frauen will be in iceland this week wednesday september 4 10 o'clock in the morning here on the east coast of the united states 1600 uh central european summertime i'm track frankfurt sporting out of portugal okay uh sporting last year a very very difficult side um a, a very deep squad by the Portuguese uh, women's standard, a very deep side, a difficult team. But yet we face them with the experience of having played in this round and advanced last year. This will be on neutral turf, not at home like it was last year. I want to know from you guys, can we get through sporting and book a trip to the winner of Minsk? And I need some help with the Islandic name here. Uh, Break the... Breath of bleak. Thank you. I, I, wasn't gonna... I was headed with it. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't gonna... uh, the, the, the D is an, an interesting character that exists in Icelandic that's like a TH in there. So, yeah. Why so... am I even on this podcast? I cannot speak any <laughs> European dialect. This is just terrible. Uh, uh, well, this is not right, you guys. trying to pronounce who you through like last year. <laughs> 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 Moving yeah. on. Moving on. Um, sporting. I'm. I'm more concerned about this than I was Ajax two years ago. I'm very concerned about our ability to beat them. Should I be worried, John? Uh, yes. They <laughs> they obviously came in second in the Portuguese division last year, have a very similar statistical profile to Benfica. I'm not going to pretend that I've watched many of their games or anything like that, but so... I don't know if they actually play similarly to them or not, but the stats were almost equivalent. And we obviously had a lot of trouble against Benfica. Um, I will say, though, it seems like cons consensus that Benfica is the better side in that league. Um, the, they also played a friendly against Benfica uh, earlier in August and lost 3-1. to one. They did just win their first league game 3 nothing though, so... Uh, it's going to be a tough game. There's no question about it. I'm nervous, but I think that we definitely have the ability to move on. And yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully we can do something. It's it's going to be might might be another extra time type of game. Both 
I mean, Ajax, they won, what, last second before going to um, extra time or whatever, and then going to penalties against Juventus. Yeah, it's. I think it's going to be another one of those. Garrett, motivate me. Tell me to change my thoughts on this and be more positive. Um, while not Benfica, this team realizes that the reason why they didn't get past the Champions League group stage last year was due to um, not getting the job done against the quality Portuguese side. You've had nine months, eight and a half months, essentially, of that festering in your mind. You, this looks like this could be a fluid side. You've already got the competitive matchups out of the way. You're in a neutral site game, as opposed to being in Portugal or anything like that. Um, John, you mentioned it. Sporting, wall quality site, aren't yet Benfica. Um, we play our game the way that we can. We'll get through the next one. But we have to play our game. Otherwise... It's a toss up. Um, do either of you venture a prediction on this one? Because I'm I'm a firm believer this one is going to penalties on a two two regulation, and it, this game will be won or lost with the predictive uh, dive capabilities of Steena Johannes. Give me I'm tracked three to two in a shootout. I will say two to one Eintracht after extra time. I think we get the job done before penalties this year, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think it has a real chance of going that far. I don't want to predict it because I don't want it to happen though. Garrett. One nil in regulation and Yomi with the goal. None of us sound very positive on this if i'm being honest <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of you know wishful thinking uh just i think part of it is the unknown unknown what sporting brings to the table and still unknown i mean i think one of the benefits we have is that we added a couple of regulars but we didn't have a big roster turnover and I think that just knowing who we are, you know, it's just a continuation of what we did last year um, and having someone with the experience of sense in that midfield attack midfield role uh, just really gives me confidence that we know who we are. We're not trying to figure anything out. I don't know what Sporting's transfer situation is, but I feel really confident in who we are. And if we play our game, I think we're in a good spot. Um, yeah. I go ahead. I, I agree. I think the the biggest reason I'm not confident in that is, like you said, the unknown. I'm not able to be watching Portuguese Women's League, you know, week in and week out. Um, and I think I would have more confidence in having watched games of theirs and seeing what they have to offer. But, you know, we have a very, very good team. We have many really incredible attacking players, a really good midfield. Maybe our defense isn't the deepest, but who we put out there to start a game, still very good, and Johannes is a very good goalkeeper as well. Like you said, we play our game, we should we should be winning it. Um, is, is this on, is the Zones YouTube got this, or is this going to be something that's on Eintracht TV like the Slovak, uh, Slovako and the uh, Sparta Prague's were before we made group stage so... last year? I'm looking at the Dotson website right now. I don't see it listed exclusively, but none of the Champions League matches are. Um, they do have it listed in their upcoming matches. I don't know if it'll be available. We're hoping. Yeah. Go ahead. My guess is it'll be a, an Eintracht TV thing. Um, I think the IX game was also Eintracht TV two years ago, right? Um, just as the first match in the... Or no, no, Ajax was the second match. And I if think not, was, I heard but... Brian's going to buy the rights to it and make sure he's it <laughs> directly to our phones. Yeah. So. Ah, we we should know. have a way of watching it at, at the very least. Yeah. So uh, certainly Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 1600 Central European time. And then if they win there, the advance uh, is to Saturday, September 7, 1 p.m. Central European time. Uh, do the math. 1900. 
uh, Central European time. And of course, we would all set down all of our college football time just to watch <laughs> on track pro and try to make their way into the group stage of the, the Champions League. Um, it's kind of a, a funky time in the calendar here, a lot going on, uh, but also at the same time, an international break. We went way over time here, uh, but it was fun talking with both of you guys. Garrett, any final thoughts on where we can find you on social media? Um, real quick, go check out footyheadlines.com to see what the rumored Eintracht Frankfurt Europa League kit is. Oh, um, no, just, 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 now, don't, now just don't. We, don't now do we got to talk. No. Now we got to talk about it. <laughs> I wasn't uh, going to go there because <laughs> I, too, no. have bought plenty of Hanes white T-shirts in my life. <laughs> and all of them had more character than this kit. That is Nathan's take, and I'm just echoing it. Guys, what the fuck are we doing? Um, it's, that, called, it's called the end of a contract, and Nike's, not, Nike's just... It's basically, like we said, Nike's not even manufacturing this. It's just whoever it is in there. That being said... I want to see the whole presentation. Will it look like a t-shirt? Probably. But who knows? I might call these the ice cream kits. We already have the Marlboro kits. I want the ice cream kits for Europa. We're going to lift the trophy in them in, in May 2025. La, La Bestia Blanca. At least, there's, at least there's that. The final's in Bilbao. But I, it's still a horrible shirt. Absolutely Brain, awful. Brain on Adidas. Hashtag three stripe life. <laughs> to, be, to be fair... If we go on to win the Europa League again, y'all are going to say this is the best kit we've ever worn. So oh, for sure. It, it doesn't matter what color it is. As long as you win, it's your favorite kit of all time. Uh, just the fact that the orange kit is the best of this cycle tells you the the depths to which how bad this, <laughs> this is. <laughs> uh, Garrett, yeah, where are bad. you on social media? All right, here we go. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, GM Comats. Those are just the personals. Um, Majors Detroit, that's at TMSNX Detroit on Twitter. The Majors TV on YouTube. Uh, 451 Detroit for all your Detroit City Sicko content. At, at 451DET on Twitter. 451 Detroit on YouTube. There's some cool stuff that we are going to be dropping in in the timelines. Also on the Majors TV for any college football sickos on there. Chris joined me for a preview in our last episode to talk Michigan State football. So uh, that is part of that one on there. Kind of, It's kind of like this. We just talk forever about sports that we love. So, um, yeah, that's all Not I got. Not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> John, how about you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Ben underscore J Ben. It's uh, Ben with two N's. Or Instagram at John Ben 33 Good stuff. Uh, and just a heads up, uh, Brian did a special episode that will be coming up soon, a transfer window special uh, with Marcus Furtoft, and that will be released hopefully this week. Um, it, and, you know, as you know, this is a fan-run, uh, fan-involved episode and fan-run podcast, and everything we do is just out of love for the club, out of love for the game. And we really invite all of you to interact at, uh, with Hang On Track Frankfurt on Instagram, Discord, uh, X, and everything else. You can find all the links at hefpod.com. You can tell me how lousy of a host I am. I am Chris in Michigan at C in the D313 on all the important uh, social media platforms. And, of course, uh, yeah, I think I covered it all, guys. That was a fun one. It was a long one. Uh, but lots of good stuff to cover, and we're going to have a lot more next week as we look at the Frown return in Champions League play, and we look forward to the return of the men the following week. And we will talk to you then. Uh, for everyone else, for Brian, who's running the show behind the scenes, for producer Nathan in St. Louis, we thank all of you. We thank our, our uh, art people, Miles, over in Minnesota during great artwork. Um, and our music from oh goodness <laughs> I have my notes there yes uh roy hammer uh for the fantastic intro outro music and of course tankard as well uh, we thank them for contributing to our show and we thank all of you for listening we'll talk to you next week cheers <laughs>
Shut up, 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 shut up